everyone. Good morning. My name is Pitsi Ulaq. I'm your moderator for today's session titled Life as a Student and Academics. And so we have a host of great panelists today. Uh, and so we have Mr. Richard Franklin Budgel. Give us a wave. <laughs> we have Jamie Takiruk. Little wave. <laughs> Nooks uh, Lindell. And Tamara Takpani. Hey, right on. Let's have let's have a great conversation for a few minutes. Um, those that have joined this session, uh, there is a couple of ways that you can interact with the panelists, but we invite you to use this time right now. Uh, to be able to submit any comments that you may have, any questions you have about this topic, life as a student and academics. So really, um, you'll be hearing from the panelists today about what, what is it like or what was it like to be uh, a student uh, during the program that you were in. And uh, so some of the questions that we have, how did you find the courses? How did you adjust to the workload? Balancing school, work, and home life. Did you want tutoring or mentorship? What was it like being in such a foreign school? Was it Tunganak? Did you have any challenges? Did you take it? Did you actually go to the library? <laughs> any all those kind of fun things. And so I invite everyone to spend a few minutes and welcoming themselves. And I'll just go from the top of my list. And just to get things off, uh, let's start with Richard Budgel. Good luck, good Richard. Welcome. Good luck. Um, good morning. Um, bonjour. Good luck to everybody. I'm uh, speaking to you from central Montreal, where I live. Um, so I guess I can talk about what was it like in a couple of phases and what it may become and what it may be like. Um, I started my academic career when I was 17 years old. That's a while ago. Um, I graduated uh, finally with a bachelor's degree in 1988 from Memorial University, the university that I had started in, but um, went to two other post-secondary institutions in that, in that period of time before I ultimately got my bachelor's degree, moved back to Labrador, where I'm from, uh, in that period of time and was not studying for a period. Um, and then ended up working, moving to Ottawa, working for the federal government. Um, and in that period of time, uh, started a graduate degree, a master's degree part-time, uh, which I obtained in 1997. Um, I retired from my career in the federal government um, last year, began, was becoming a new career. I'm called a professor of practice in the Department of Family Medicine at McGill University here in Montreal. Um, and so involved in some research projects, some development of teaching projects, and also um, learned last month that I have been accepted into a doctorate program, a PhD, uh, that I will be starting next September. It's in a discipline, a stream called the history of medicine in, in uh, history, in the um, Faculty of History and Classical Studies. So um, I guess I want to convey to you, there can be interruptions in your career. There can be changes of direction, changes of your mind, changes of where you may want to go. And that's good. That's fine. Uh, you can change your mind. You can make mistakes and you can learn from those mistakes. Uh, I would tell you, I think it is very Inuit to be adaptable. I think that's one of our, you know, highest values maybe and characteristics and in an academic career that is something that you can and should practice as well and don't be too hard on yourself if you make mistakes because that's that's the way that you learn that's you know you learn from making mistakes sometimes more than you learn from from being successful um, and it you know it does not have to be a straight line some people have or i guess 
you know, that is the way that they're made and they're very certain about what they may want to do from the beginning. I wasn't. Um, and I am kind of at this point, I feel like I'm an accidental academic, um, but I'm quite happy to be where I am and, you know, to have taken the path that I did because, you know, you have a lifetime to, you know, make these kinds of decisions and your education should be a continuing process throughout your life. And I think that's also very Inuit that we see ourselves as people that continue to continue to learn throughout throughout the course of our, our lives. Maybe I should stop there, Petulik. Hand it over to someone else. Thank you, Thank you Richard, for introducing yourself and uh, letting us know uh, a little bit about your academic uh, and personal life. It's very nice. Thank you so much for introducing us. Um, well, maybe I could move over to Tamara Tekpani. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm not too sure. We can't see who's in the audience, but I'm Tamara. Um, I just graduated from Carleton University. I started there after my little stint at Nunavut Sivuniksavut, um, which I was there from 2014 to 16. So I guess um, post-secondary for quite some time, and it's, it's interesting to be out of it. But while you're in it, um, there's so many different experiences, like Richard had mentioned, um, you can change paths so many times. So um, after NS, I was hoping to go into the Department of Social Work. Of course, that's a very competitive program. Um, they referred me to the Department of Psychology. Um, so then I started my um, university career there and I switched a few different times. I added neuroscience, which was kind of crazy. I dropped neuroscience and then I added um, because Carleton had started a program um, that has a double honors with Indigenous studies, then you can pick your second um, program. So I did that with psychology. Um, so a lot of my courses were were super tough in the psychology realm. You can like, it's very scientific based. That's something that I'm not super used to. They test a lot with um, multiple choice, which isn't my strong suit. I love writing. I'm a writer. So whenever I was taking my Indigenous Studies courses, you know, of course, that's like where my knowledge lies, right? Especially with my NS training. Um, so that was quite nice. I ended up dropping psychology to a minor so that I can just graduate a little bit faster. I'm also um, a young mom, so my son is nine years old now. So he's been through it all. <laughs> he's seen me finish my high school, finish my um, college, and then ultimately finish my university. So it, it was quite quite a ride with him. Um, and I know that he looks up to me because he, like we've been on the go, I think now with the pandemic, uh, this is the, the slowest we've ever gone. <laughs> kind of just staying at home, enjoying ourselves, getting to know each other more. Um, but um, I think a piece of advice that I have for students who are thinking about going or who are already within um, their schooling is just to be kind to yourself and remember that you're doing this. This is all you and you have the power to um, take it in whichever direction you want. So if you're if you're struggling, I struggled a lot between maybe 2016, 17 and a little bit of 18. A lot of it, I didn't want to finish uh, my degree and I really was, it was hard, but you're, you have the power to push through. Um, the resources out there are great. So like at Carleton, for example, um, they have the Ajigunong Center. So I would always go there, see my fellow Inuit there, meet other indigenous peoples, create connections. Um, they had a bunch of beating sessions. Of course, now because of COVID, it's different. I know they're doing a lot of online um, things like this now elders that go in you can always advocate for more more of an Inuit lens to it so what we do as students there um, we ask for them to bring in Inuit elders we asked for them to get our country food so it think the programs that are there they're meant for you you can tell them what you want and you kind of kind of just like tailor it to you it's not it's being an adult is so funny because yeah you're <laughs> you're there and you're doing their programs but you can tailor it to you and not a lot of people know that and like you can just go ahead and and speak up and say look I'm a student here you know I pay tuition and I want these to help me and and you can kind of do that it's 
it's quite fluid. Um, they also have a great mentorship program. I did that for about a semester-ish. So um, you just kind of sign up. They have like newsletters and stuff. So I signed up through this system. This was quite a while ago. Um, and then you would meet with another student who you're paired with, someone who, who kind of matches your profile. Um, and then you meet up with them. They give good advice like we went and met the library yeah I, I utilized the library a lot mostly just for like studying and that was it that was a good place good place to be um so yeah i guess just this is your world four years it's not a long time it flew by like crazy um but when you're in the middle of it just take advantage of everything you have there and kind of just take it from there. If you need help, always reach out because the previous students, they're, they're super helpful. And I think that's all I have to say. That's fantastic. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, well, it reminds me of my time at Carleton. Uh, I graduated from there in 2018. Uh, when I first started at Carleton, uh, I was running the Aboriginal Service Center for CUSA and uh, had a really great time at Carleton. So thanks for sharing that and reminding me of my time there. So wonderful. We heard Tamara talk about, uh, you know, advocating for yourself. You know, it's something that we don't often do when we're in our little communities. Um, you know, we just, we just do what we're told. But, um, you know, getting into university life, uh, it's a big place. There's Carleton had 15,000 students. So when I first went there, it was like, what is this? Where are my people? <laughs> so definitely reaching out to find your people. And, uh, and you're absolutely right. You have to advocate for yourself. You have to speak up. You have to tell people what you want. And that is a real shift away from our communities about our little community lifestyle. It's, uh, it's the big city. And, uh, they'll chew you up. So you got to step up and speak up. So wonderful. Thank you so much. We're getting some great connections already. Just give everyone a heads up. Uh, we have Jamie who's going to speak next, please. And then we're going to hear from Nooks. So thanks so much. Let's continue this conversation. Jamie, welcome. Hi, I would like it. Um, my name is Jamie, Ta Jamie Takiro. I'm originally from Joe Haven, Nunavut. And uh, currently, I'm living in Iqaluit, uh, attending the Nunavut Law Program. Um, before I came here, I went to Nunavut Sibunik Sabut first year uh, in 2016 to 17. And uh, I went to NS straight out of uh, high school. So the only life I've known is really as a student, other than summer jobs here and there. And um, <laughs> these last four years especially have have just been crazy. Um, we're, we're set to... Uh, we're set to finish our program in uh, this coming June. We're all to graduate. 20, there's still going to be 23 of us. And it, um, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to graduating with my peers and um, getting into the world of um, law. Um, I, I haven't had, other than being a, a law student, I don't really think that I've had um, quite an interesting career. Just I, all I've been doing is reading and writing and making notes. <laughs> there, there hasn't been much real time for anything else. Just right now, I'm actually, it's actually cutting into some study time. So it's, uh, my, yeah. Um, there was something that Richard said earlier that kind of struck, uh, struck a chord with me. He said that he's sort of an accidental academic. And I can, I can feel that because I'm kind of an accidental law student. You know, I was at NS. Um, it was the second semester. I didn't know what I was going to do afterwards. Um, and then I saw that there was a law program being offered here in Iqaluit. And I thought, hey, my, I, it's in Nunavut. Um, I don't see my, I don't want to live anywhere else other than Nunavut. And so I figured, why not give it a shot? And that shot has uh, lasted me about four years right now. And, um, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm really. I'm really looking forward to talking about my life as a student, uh, answering questions, and I'm um, also looking forward to, uh, yeah, just being here. Kaya na Jamie, The floor is yours, sir. <laughs> Nice to, thanks. Nice to meet you again. Thank you so much. 
e yeah cool to hear everybody's stories uh e so kinen nooks lindell yung mama inu yung ave muto yung kinen nooks lindell from ave nunavut um uh growing up uh i was raised in ave but uh, when i was about 7 we moved to ottawa um so mainly i spoke only inuktitut um before moving to ottawa um but within a year i almost completely lost my inuktitut and, and became pretty good at english um like i i start from there because there's um if anybody's done it before uh the schooling down south and the schooling in Nunavut there's there's quite a big difference um so the rest of my kind of middle school and high school I, I spent uh I spent years in Ottawa and then would um spend a year in Upbeat or in Rankin and um growing up in Ottawa I um I was always very close to the Nunavut Sibuniksavut group um my mum was a member of parliament at the time and um for those of you that don't know Nunavut Sibuniksavut it's a program in Ottawa where it takes Inuk Nunavut students uh, and they learn about Inuit um Inuit Inuit uh, Inuit history uh negotiations of the land claims um and the land claims itself also um um like english and uh, other courses like public speaking and so i grew up and um it was always very nice uh there were inuit in ottawa but not not as many as there are now and there's a really big community there now um so it was always nice to to see the the inuk students um and i always had a very good vibe uh they were always so happy um and you could tell they were interested in what they were learning uh so from an early age i knew i wanted to go to ns um and so after high school that's what i did i graduated in rankin at manuel bilinelik uh grade 12 and then um, i went to ns which um i say was the most was one of the best decisions i made um i in school i was always very interested in history but then when i actually learned about we never learned about inuit history in high school uh it was always like world wars and stuff like that and <laughs> uh learning about stuff that doesn't necessarily relate to us so getting to learn about inuit history i was um i was hooked and uh it really changed the way that i felt about being you know and um yeah it help uh, help build a foundation um for myself i would say to help me find myself so i did 2 years of that after high school um after that i spent a year uh volunteering with uh canada road youth which was also a really good experience uh cuz after 2 years at NS I still didn't know what I wanted to do um so that's that's another option that's uh that I would suggest uh you get to travel we spent 3 months in Winnipeg 3 months in uh, in Kenya and um <clears throat> I think more and more growing up you know, as I get older um like I was always taught that you you could learn from everybody even people the same age or younger um especially from people older than you so that uh it sounds kind of cheesy but like you know be a student all the time um that you don't have to be in a classroom to learn that um uh learning from people in your community um can be just as important as uh academia and the knowledge you already have um is super important and not to not to downplay uh, all that inuit knowledge of like hunting and stuff like that sorry excuse me
Um, so yeah, um, I guess just to go over the more of the stuff we learned at NS, um, yeah, definitely uh, learning about the land claims um, really interested me. Uh, like I knew we had Nunavut, but I didn't know the history behind it. And um, it was really cool to hear, uh, really cool and really, like it gets you really fired up. I'm sure Jamie and Tamara have had the same. Um, they really, it's hard not to be passionate when you learn about these things. When you learn about colonization, you get angry and you learn you learn stuff that's difficult to learn, but it but it really motivates you to to, to do something, you know. Um, knowing how hard Inuit had it in the past, um, same with uh, First Nations in Canada and the U.S. And um, same thing with learning about the negotiations for the land claims. Um, I definitely didn't appreciate it um, because I didn't know it took 30 years to negotiate and that we're so lucky uh, to have a land claims in a whole territory uh, rather than a treaty that's, you know, not even followed and um, a small piece of land. So learning about learning about that definitely made me appreciate uh, where I live a lot more. Uh, so it's something that, that I suggest, um, even if you have an idea of where you want to, what you want to do and where you want to go, um, kind of, especially if you're, you're in high school in Nunavut, um, I think most high schools, I would, the, the workload is so different from university and college, um, I've only taken a couple university and college courses and I, I really struggled um because academia is not my strong suit like i really love learning and listening but writing and uh, actually doing the work i always kind of struggled with um so um yeah after after uh canada world youth i i got a job as a producer um i was co-creator for the Panoli show, the Inuktitut comedy series. So I wrote, wrote and produced and directed um, that show for four years. Uh, after that, I went back to school at uh, in Iqaluit for the environmental technology program. I, I just remembered you said to talk slowly and I'm talking super fast. <laughs> Sorry to the translator. Um, <laughs> I'll give them some time to catch up. Um, so I've, I've always been interested in um, in wildlife and environment. So, um, yeah, taking the environmental technology program in Ekaduit, kind of like Jamie said, I wanted to keep learning, but I wanted to stay in stay in uh, stay in stay in Nunavut at least. Um, I really enjoyed the program because it was a good mix of um, on the land skills and classroom skills. Um, I do enjoy the classroom, but it's always it's always fun to be able to um, like to go out hunting and just to we learned how to build igloos and stuff like that. Um, I'm from Alvet, so. Uh, it's super flat if nobody's ever, if nobody's been there before. But so during ATP it was the first time I drove a skidoo like in the hills and in in the mountains. Super scary. <laughs> but uh, learning how to do that was uh, was fun. You meet really good people, um, create friendships that'll that'll last, and um, yeah, it's pretty cool because. This was a while ago now. This was um, like over what, like six or seven years ago now. And it's cool to see the people that were in my class and the positions they are now. They're like, some of them are pretty high up in government. So that's always cool to see. Um, after after ETP, I, I was in research for six years. Um, about three years with a nonprofit, Akumovic Society, which is community-based research, and then um, three years with the government of Nunavut. Um, 
so that that was pretty cool um, because having having the education um, having that ETP really helped me with that job. I wouldn't have been able to get it without it. And um, as before with producing, I had no experience producing whatsoever. So it was just all, um, it was all, uh, yeah, learning on the job. Um, but yeah, that was a lot of fun. And that's, that's a field that I think a lot of Inuit have potential in is uh, wildlife biology. You get to be out on the land, and um, as you all know, Inuit are very important. Uh, all right. So wildlife are very important to Inuit. So uh, yeah, I'll I'll st I'll stop there and let let the others talk. Well, you you definitely have a lot to share, Nooks. Thanks so much for uh, giving us a really um lengthy overview of your history uh, i think a lot of us can relate to that kind of it's never a straight path and trying different things and tamara, tamara was talking about this um you know it's you try one thing try another thing it's not working out uh richard opened up with that as well we're seeing a very common thread and um and so thank you i think we're starting to see some some really strong connections around speaking up um, you know, the academics is something that we should really touch on for a few minutes. Um, the, the subject of this uh, panel is the student and academics. And so Tamara was talking and looks to some degree was also talking about this. Primarily all of you were, but you know, what's what I find interesting in this is uh, a comment that was made around being an Inuk going into university. Could be at NS, could be at the college, um, law program, health sciences. Uh, all of these types of disciplines uh, touches on Inuit. And so when I was in university, any subject, any course that I took, I always wanted to apply it into what does it mean for Inuit and how can I write about it? One of the biggest challenges for me was learning how to write up one paragraph really well. That took that took some time, and so once uh, once you learn how to start writing a strong paragraph, uh, you know it, it becomes it becomes quite easier. And so the, my point being is that we almost have to transition when we get into this academic space. And uh, writing, reading, and writing it is a chore and a half. Tamara, you talked about exams. Um, yes, uh, gosh, I'm still in therapy on that one. Um, so maybe we could share a little bit. Let's do one final round because this time is going so fast and I've been instructed that this session ends in 13 minutes. So please, let's give the audience a little taste of, of uh, being an Inuk, writing about Inuit. Um, what was it like? Um, you know, you're able to explore issues as Inuit. So is this a common thread for you? Is this something, did you always um, focus everything back on in Inuit context? So maybe I think that'd be really interesting for everybody to, uh, to, to ch chat about. I'd like to start with Tamara, if I could. Sure, I have lots to say. <laughs> um, uh, remi reminding myself of the translator, so I'll try and be slow but quick. Um, in all of my courses, the general degree is what I ended up with. So 15, 15 um, credits, that's 30 classes because each are cut in half. So every single course, there is an outline and, and professors ask of you different things depending on what you're learning. Um, but every single paper I've written has been tailored to Inuit. So the one thing that sticks out to me the most um, was in my first ever sociology course. It was an elective, Sociology 1001. Um, our first paper was very simple. Um, they always start out simple. It was two pages, and it was a sociology of a meme. 
And even though this was five years ago, I can still remember we had to pick a meme and write about it with the with the terms that we were learning in sociology. So I decided um, they made us physically go out and, and take our own picture. But I had emailed the professor and I said, hey, like, I'm Inuk. I always introduced myself to every professor, um, always made myself known because I would always be the one with my hand up and inserting myself into every lecture. Um, but I said, I have um, a very particular sign that I want to take a picture of, um, but it's in the north, it's in the Arctic. I can't take it, but I can get my friend to. So everyone would be familiar with the Skidoo crossing. So I chose that one and he said, okay, go ahead. Um, usually professors have uh, teaching assistants who grade your papers. Um, so of course that link wasn't made, so they didn't know that I was going to be doing this. And they wanted, they tried, attempted to grade my thing super wrong because I was using, you know, knowledge that I've known um, as an Inuk woman. And um, it just so happens that you're kind of teaching everyone when you're doing that type of stuff when you're inserting yourself as an Inuk into this institution that is built upon colonialism, that is built upon um, structures that only Kalunaks know about, um, you're the first to really do it. Um, and so, yeah, I've fought a lot of grades and I've always gotten them pushed up because they do make sense to me and they make sense as an academic um, looking at it from an Inuit lens. But um, I think that would be my best advice is if you get a terrible grade, but you know you did well, um, you can always contest it because they have rubrics, whether or not they shared it, because they have an option as professors to share it or not. Um, they have an option and you can say, let me see your rubric. And then you show them every point that you made. Um, and just because it's not from a Western lens, because it's not something they're familiar with or know about, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just different. And that's uh, a, a big piece of advice that I have. You don't have to be westernized in order to go through the colonial institutions. Represent. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. It's so familiar to me, I think, for all of us. Uh, and so, please, I remind everyone that we only have about uh, five minutes left. So I do want to have an opportunity to, for Richard to go next, and then Jamie, Hopefully not the last word, but that means you better finish strong, bud. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> JV, no pressure, buddy. <laughs> so, Richard, please, just a few short seconds. Um, I'll go fast but slow for the translators. I think you have to see yourself in what you're studying. And uh, I am with probably everybody else in saying I had to create my own path to see myself in what I was studying because, you know, I went through the Newfoundland school curriculum in Labrador in the 60s and 70s, and there was Indigenous people, including Inuit, were invisible in that curriculum. So when I, by the time I went to post-secondary, I had to find ways to see myself and my my people in, in what I was studying. I remember doing a comparison of uh, Susanna Moody, an English uh, English writer in the pre-Confederation 19th century in Canada, who wrote a book called Roughing It in the Bush. I compared that to a memoir that was wrote by, written by an ancestor of mine, whose name was Lydia Campbell, who wrote a memoir called Sketches of Labrador Life, also from the 19th century, and one very foreign vision of the Canadian wilderness versus a vision from an Enoch woman in Labrador looking at her own uh, country, really, her own uh, landscape and people living in that place. And they were very contrasting. So, yet, you know, I have always found ways of seeing myself in my own education. And we have to create that ourselves and hopefully you'll be surrounded by people who are supportive to that and and I have been uh, at Memorial University at Carleton where I did my master's degree and now I hope at, at McGill uh, but you know that's one of the things that, that we have to do and you can find sympathetic people to to assist you with that I'll stop there thank you uh, that's that's 
That's fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you for contributing to a great conversation. Thank you. And uh, no, Jamie, no rush, no rush. Just uh, we'd love to hear how, if this relates to you, uh, wanting to write about Inuit, Inuit history and inserting your own questions into your academic life. Yeah, um, in a sense, it, uh, it kind of does. But uh, first off, um, I think that we in the Nunavut Law Program have been super privileged uh, in terms of the uh, the professors that we get here. Uh, they get flown up here from uh, various universities, from the University of Saskatchewan, which is um, the course that we're taking, and then some have come from other universities in, in Canada. And I don't, there's, with the exception of one or two, I think every single prof has made, made, it, uh, made it a point to have Nunavut specific cases, to have Nunavut, um, to have cases that we study, uh, cases that come out of the court, I should, I should clarify, um, court cases that um, deal with indig indigenous or even Inuit specific issues. And so uh, we've been very lucky that we've been we've been given the space to uh, to have discussions like this, and be provided the uh, the option and the uh, the opportunity to write about things that affect Indigenous people, to write about things that affect Inuit people. I remember it was last semester. Um, don't ask me specific questions about it because I've, I've forgotten it already. But I wrote a paper. It was about how uh, culture and identity affects the addiction rates and the incarceration rates of Inuit in Nunavut. And so I think I got a good mark on that one. I was really proud of it. I worked really hard on it. And so um, I feel very lucky that we've been given spaces where we don't have to fight to get these issues talked about, to, to, uh, to, to advocate for ourselves to get these issues, to get these topics uh, in the classroom. And um, yeah, no, but I recognize how hard it could be down, doing that down south in, in situations uh, such as Richard and Tamara, you know, down there. People, Inuit aren't the top priority down south, you know, like we, we're just people from the north. And it's, in, it's fun to share, but at the same time, it can be very tiring. Um, always having to explain yourself, always having to, uh, to describe the context in which that you're speaking. And I just feel lucky that because we're in Iqalu, because we're in Nunavut, in Nunangat, you know, I don't have to preface everything by saying, you know, up in the Arctic, we do this kind of thing, you know, in the Inuit culture, we do this. And so I don't know if I'm a very strong, <laughs> strong, strong ending, but uh, that's just what I have to say on that topic about uh, advocating for Inuit in, uh, in the academic context. All very relevant. And uh, yes, indeed. Um, I, I think I have found some commonality for all of us. And uh, uh, and before I kind of wrap it up, uh, we've got about three minutes, but I wanted to add kind of uh, some perspectives from the audience um, today, if there's any burning questions that people have. Um, so a couple of comments already is that learning to speak up was difficult, but necessary. And I think that's uh, something that Tamara has really expressed strongly. That's your wonderful example of that. Also, Nooks and Jamie and, and Richard, thank you. Another comment that has come from the audience. Life is change constantly. Never stop trying. You can do anything you want. Yes, absolutely. Uh, everyone who has participated and, and watched these panelists today uh, have, I think, uh, demonstrated that it's not a straight path, uh, but it requires, um, it requires an ability to be able to just push through it. There's going to be obvious challenges. Tamara, you talked about taking advantage of all the supports in whatever institution that you're learning in. If it's, uh, if it's tutoring or mentorship or just uh, making yourself at home in the Indigenous Student Lounge. And, uh, and really, I think, Tamara, you said it. Um, I did the same thing. I went up and introduced myself to each professor. It's like, here I am. We know each other now. And when you introduce yourself to a professor, they, they actually very much appreciate it. And it might give you a leg up 
when uh, when their final marks happen so seriously. And it's really kind of uh, and it's really goes it goes against our intuition and uh, because we don't want to uh, you know approach people too often, but it requires us to go through a, a bit of a stretch uh, for our own type of personality. Everyone, you've been amazing. Uh, what I want to say is that um, that uh, that you get a chance to meet these folks sometime. Um, but it was a great conversation. Thank you for watching. I'm going to definitely take something away from everything that you've all said. It's been amazing. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. And everyone else in the audience, have a wonderful conference or gathering, it's called. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Let's give everyone a wave. Take care.